Hi, this is Claudia Filos at the Center for Hellenic Studies. Um, and hold on one second, I'm just going to adjust the camera. Thanks. This is Claudia Filos with the Center for Hellenic Studies, and I'm here today with Professor Shiba Patak. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And Janet Oslak. Thanks for joining us here today, Janet. My pleasure. It's a great joy to have you both here. So um, today, Shuba, we're here to talk to you about your book, um, Divine Yet Human Epics. Um, and so I, I was hoping, uh, well, first let me introduce you, okay, so just so people have a little bit of background. So you are um, an associate professor at the Department of Philosophy and Religion uh, at American University. You're a historian of religions who studies mythology, literatures of India, Greece, and Rome, in addition to teaching courses on comparative philosophy and comparative religion. You're a researcher in Greco-Roman and Indian epics in their original and later literary forms, focusing on their theological and narratological dimensions. Um, you, uh, your book is now available through Harvard University Press. Uh, and in addition, in the next coming days, um, probably in, a, let's say, probably within two weeks, the, the oh. entire manuscript, <laughs> full-length manuscript will be available on the CHS website. Uh, if you visit that at www.chs.harvard.edu. You can find not only Professor uh, Patak's book, but you will also find over a hundred uh, full-length monographs and articles. Um, so we encourage you to do that. Um, so, so anyway, actually, so I just want to welcome you again. We're so excited to have you. Oh, it's great to be here. And uh, <laughs> can we just start by talking uh, about your book briefly, sure. right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to introduce our Professor Patak has chosen four focus passages for us to consider today and read together. Uh, if you're joining us, um, if you're watching us as one of our viewers, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be using our Q&A feature in a little while, so we really appreciate your viewership, uh, and we'll be taking your questions. If you want to follow along and you want to see those focus passages, what you want to do is visit the C the, the Hour 25 website, um, and you can if there's a, a PDF that you can access of the focus passages. So thank you so much. I also want to welcome actually all of our wonderful community members here today uh, who are joining us in Hollywood, Hollywood Squares. Uh, thank you so much. And so when we actually begin our discussion and you ask questions or you introduce a comment, I'd invite you to introduce yourself then. But I just want you to know that we have people joining us from all over the world today. So let's start. So excited. Great. So, um, so let's start uh, with your book, right, which is um, which is really beautiful. And I love that you're covering such a huge huge epics, right? <laughs> and, and really epic is really the word because for you, that's sort of the crux of it, right? That's something you're trying to write, get at the heart of. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, one of the challenges in trying to deal with such monumental compositions, long compositions, is trying to figure out how is it that you can actually get your head around it in a way that will not take more than a lifetime to actually <laughs> come out with something to share. Right. So. Um, I think my challenge was to sort of figure out what my focus point would be. And so I, I think what I found most helpful was just to try to think about what, we, what it is that we call an epic, why is it that we call epics epics, and how is it that these poems uh, give us hints as to how they might be perceived or how perhaps they can be perceived, and uh, what kinds of resources do they offer us to help us think about um, what is it that we lose or gain when we call them epics? Right, right. And you know, I, uh, mistakenly, I didn't give the whole the, your full title actually, which explains a lot more. Uh, it's Divine Human Epics: Reflections of Poetic Rulers from Ancient Greece and India. Mm -hmm. So that's whole title. So that gives you more of an idea of sort of the approach that you're taking. So. Um, what we start off with one of our focus passages, and maybe you could just say why you chose these sure. specific focus passages for us. Yeah, and so uh, as Claudia mentioned, uh, there is a subtitle for the book. It's Reflections of Poetic Rulers from Ancient Greece and India. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I noticed when I was looking at these epics is that they each seem to present, they seem to present in prominent ways these rulers who act like poets. And so in both the Greek tradition and the Indian tradition, you have these rulers who seem to take on the characteristics of poets. And in some cases, uh, they actually are called poets. So uh, what's interesting, I think, is that in the Greek tradition, the, the uh, rulers who do this are actually the heroes themselves. So uh, we have Achilles uh, in the brief period when he's away from the battlefield. Uh, while he's nursing his grudge against Agamemnon, um, trying to figure out um, sort of, I think, what his place is. Mm -hmm. And he, 
is playing on the lyre and he's singing the clay on the the um, glorious deeds of men. And so this is the focus of the first passage. Mm -hmm. The second passage uh, is uh, a similar kind of scene, except here now we are uh, on Ithaca after the war, and uh, Odysseus is with his wife Penelope, but he's disguised uh, as a beggar, and so she doesn't necessarily know that uh, it's he. And so in this passage, uh, I think he's kind of pointing toward what he hopes to have happen, because he's talking about the blameless king who has uh, re restored his kingdom, essentially, mm -hmm. or, or at least has, has replenished it. Um, it, the idea of restoration isn't prominent in his description of it, but I think we can read it into it based on the events in, mm -hmm. in the epic. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in these first two passages, then, you have the, the rulers acting like poets themselves. In the second, in the third and the fourth passages, these are uh, passages from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And uh, instead of focusing on Kleos and on heroic glory, we focus now on dharma or righteousness. And so in this tradition, what we seem to find is that uh, both the um, Ramayana and the Mahabharata feature rulers who actually listen to other rulers acting like poets. Mm -hmm. And so the heroes then are not themselves actually performing the poetry, but what they're doing is they're somehow linked to these other rulers who are similar to them for some reason. Mm -hmm. And so you have um, in the Ramayana, the hero Rama is actually uh, hearing from his own twin sons who are acting um, playing the role of what we would call a rhapsode in, in Greek tradition. Mm -hmm. they have, they're have they actually reciting the Ramayana poem in the Ramayana. And uh, in the Mahabharata, the hero Yudhishthira is hearing about a, a king named Nella who actually takes on the role of a poet. He becomes um, a type of epic poet who uh, normally performs this type of poetry, um, but it's an earlier type of bard than what we, we find in the uh, Ramayana. So uh, he's sort of more akin to the uh, Oidos, the, the bard uh, in the mm -hmm. Greek tradition. Um, so this king Nulla has lost his wife. He has to get her back. It's, it's sort of, there's some interesting resonances with the Odyssey in general. And so uh, that's the focus of passage four. So, so there's a lot to discuss. And I think we're seeing within some of the things we've already been discussing in our community for quite a while now. Um, we're seeing a lot of these themes about the relationship between uh, the Clea Andron and Glory and fathers and sons, right? So um, why don't we start off first with Iliad, and uh, maybe we can invite one of our community members to read, uh, to read this first focus passage. Is there anyone who'd like to read? Everyone's being shy. <laughs> okay. Um, did, would you like me to screen share the uh, passage oh, as well? That would be fabulous. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, well, bear with me a second. Yes. So uh, if you're listening in, okay, and you don't happen to have the handout, what we're going to be looking at is Iliad Scroll or Book 9, depending on how you call it, lines 185 through 191. <laughs> so we have to yes, click on Sarah, yeah. right? Okay, one moment, please. I'm going to project what Sarah is showing so that hopefully, um, oh, there we go. We're using a slightly different setup this week than usual because we're here at the center, which is always a joy. Uh, but it's a little bit of a learning experience, so you should be seeing that. Yes, I okay. can see it here. They came upon the Myrmidons' shelters and ships and lighted on him, delighting in the clear sounds of the beautifully wrought silver-bridged lyre that he had got from the spoils of Etion's city after destroying it. With the lyre, his heart's delight, Achilles was singing of the glorious deeds of men, and only Patroclus was sitting opposite him in silence, waiting for the moment when this scion of Aesius would cease singing. Beautiful. So, so can you help us sort of think about this passage? Um, you know, in the last few hangouts that we've had, uh, they've been a little bit less discussion oriented. Yeah. So we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna get the ball rolling here. Um, so, what I mean, how do we begin with this? I mean, one of the things that I think is is interesting about this passage is that you kind of 
you, you have the experience of kind of coming upon Achilles in the same way that the members of the embassy do. You know, they just sort of find him there. Mm -hmm. And we also are kind of following along and we, we, we find him there. So from the start, it's kind of marked as this strange interruption on the battlefield. And so uh, other scholars have, have tried to think about what it, what it is that that means. You know, mm -hmm. why do we all of a sudden see Achilles sitting here strumming on the lyre, mm -hmm. you know, when normally we would expect him to be wielding weapons and going out and fighting. So I think uh, we have a few things going on. We have uh, the beautiful description of the lyre and, and him taking it mm -hmm. and, and playing on it. Um, we have the history of the lyre, which is really, really important here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have... Um, the the interaction or not non interaction depending on how you look at it between Achilles and Patroclus. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so why would you say non interaction? That's so interesting. Yeah. Well, I think it it, it seems to be. I I think it's an interaction. Yeah. But exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But this seems to be actually up for debate because I think some people think that. If there isn't necessarily an interaction, then Patroclus is basically acting like the rest of the embassy members, just sort of waiting around for him to f to finish singing. So, passive. It, so, to, so to some people, it seems very passive. But how are the people reading that? Any thoughts about that, guys? What we're talking about? Not yet. So, okay, I can check. Oh, can Jeff, do you have your hand up? No, I don't think so. So. Um, yeah, I mean, when I think about that kind I of... I think Jeff wants to say something. Jeff, oh. you're muted, though. It oh, looks okay. like Jeff's screen is a little bit frozen. Yeah, I um, right. So, Jeff, we'll look forward to your question in just a moment, okay? Um, he's waiting his turn. Okay. Yeah. So, I think, um, um, you know, it's... Oh, did you get it? Oh, well, I, I think there's... Uh, interesting ambivalence or ambiguity in it uh, as it comes you know uh, they they went uh, the ambassadors went and they were uh, you know had prayed to uh, to Poseidon that the heart of uh, the uh, kind of Iacus e e e would uh, be persuaded so they look they want to get him in a in a, uh, a receptive mood and mm -hmm. uh, and there uh, the, the the poet describes them uh, arriving there, and he is uh, performing, and uh, and uh, uh, Pat Patroclus is uh, uh, in the receptive mood, uh, and so I, I think there's a I think by uh, approaching them there, you know, they're not. Um, I think there's a certain questionableness, you know, whether they've got him in a in at the right time. Uh, that, that's that's how I read it, you know. As as a there's a, it's a suspenseful moment, and there mm -hmm. they arrive here, and uh, he's singing the Clea Andron, which uh, you know reflects back to the major theme of the of the uh, of the Iliad. So. I think it's uh, it's it's interesting ambiguity worth studying further. So what do you think? I think that's nice. I mean, one of the things that's that's um, that I think works really well in this pa passage is that, um, as Jack mentioned, this this idea of sort of building up to to this moment of resolution. I think the 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 fact that. Um, we're sort of experiencing the performance with uh, with the ambassadors as they come in, um, and Patroclus. I mean, his role is ambiguous. I think. I think it is. It is. It, it can be taken in different ways. Mm -hmm. Kimmy just pointed out uh, that uh, Patroclus's name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Kimmy, would you like to say a little something about that? <laughs> I can't talk too well, but uh, I think if, if they were having private moments themselves, but we we kind of come into it almost like an intruding in their space. But the song that Achilles is singing, and I think 
had brought us to be listening and waiting for his return. And uh, his domain and the song, they all tie in. And I think it was, it, it was really a significant moment because of what unfolds after that. You know, mm -hmm. in that story, like uh, 11 and so on, <laughs> book 11 and so on. Yeah. That's how I read it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I didn't hear the last part of, of uh, Kimmy's comment. Oh, Kimmy, can you just repeat that last part? Okay, the, the, that scene with, with Achilles singing and Patroclus waiting for his son, his name, is very significant because of what unfolds after in scroll 11 and 16, but uh -huh. in scroll 8, Zeus already said Patroclus is going to die. Yeah. You know? So it's a very kind of shifting moment in my in my view. <laughs> does, does that make sense? Yes. I don't yes. Really it, well. Okay. It does. I think um one thing that's interesting too is the fact that there's this contrast drawn between Achilles and Patroclus, because mm -hmm. Achilles is the one who's going to achieve Cleos. Whereas Patroclus only really is famous for being his companion for, for having a kind of accessory type of fame. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that his silence here can also be read as the fact that he himself is not going to participate as fully in the tradition of, as Achilles is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm thinking about the ways, one of the things we've talked about in our, uh, in our conversations in the past, and you know, this is following Greg, is this idea that, um, so that, you know, Patroclus is a theropon, and he's a ritual substitute, right? And um, Professor Lana Milner, uh, who has been a frequent visitor uh, to our discussions, has talked about the way that um, sort of the relationship between Patroclus and Achilles is so close that Achilles at this point, right, he, he almost, he's having trouble really making a distinction between himself mm -hmm. um, and Patroclus. So, I don't know, it's just it's such a fascinating moment to think about him almost saying to his other self, right? Yeah. And Patroclus is going to continue the song at the very start, uh, Achilles stops, right? Can so you guys hear that? That, that is, go, that's the co same song continuing, uh, maybe in the way he is in the song. Mm. Right, right, right. Yeah, and so, I mean, one way to read this, I mean, for, for, for people who think that Patroclus is acting here like another rhapsode picking up where he leaves mm -hmm. off, where, mm -hmm. where Achilles leaves off, uh, is to say that we're shown the moment before Achilles has actually entered the poetic tradition, and then if Patroclus were to pick up, perhaps it would it would be to sing of Achilles or to, to, to do it symbolically, to, oh, to okay. kind of pick up a, a moment when when Achilles no longer is the one who's performing, but is the one who's actually entered into uh, the Cleod themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's an interesting scene. I mean, it's I do think there, there are different ways to read it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And But in terms of, because uh, I think one of the things it sounds like we're going to be talking about later is this idea of um, learning to be a good ruler, right? And, and this idea of education is an important aspect of mm -hmm. it. So, but the you know the idea of learning to sing songs um, that would have been part of a hero's education too right I mean that's a very heroic thing it is it is I think one of the interesting things I, I find about Achilles experience as opposed to Odysseus's experience is that at least on my reading of this it seems to me that Achilles is someone who is more a rhapsode than a bard he's someone who actually has perf is performing things that already are, are preformed in a sense. The Cleandron are already, I mean, he's, he's already inherited a poetic tradition. Mm -hmm. He's not actually, I mean, he, he may be innovating in that he's, he's composing it as he perform, mm -hmm. performs it, but he's not, he's not starting with nothing. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think Odysseus acts more like an oidos, like a, a bard who actually is, is starting with less and mm -hmm. is, is actually originating more of the content. And I think that's important just because um, I think the way that the Iliad presents Achilles is as someone 
whose class is not in doubt. I mean, this I, I know I, I differ mm -hmm. here from, mm -hmm. from some scholars, no, no, but, no, that's yeah. so but that. yeah. Uh -huh. So in my view, I think um, because his his path is essentially fixed in a way, and as a semi-divine hero, as someone who knows from the start, who's been told over and over again by Thetis, his mom, uh, that he's going to die, um, his trajectory seems to be fairly fixed even though he deviates from it temporarily here. So mm -hmm. even though he leaves the battlefield, I mean he leaves the fighting and even though he's not engaged in the activity for which he's going to become famous, um, he's not actually, we don't, at, at this point we don't see him, we don't see how he could necessarily go and uh, kill Hector and die in, in uh -huh. Troy himself. Uh -huh. But perhaps pa the Patroclus', Patroclus presence there is signaling that He's, there's going to be the linkage there, and this goes back, I think, to Kimmy's point about how later on, when Achilles is drawn back in to mm -hmm. avenge Patroclus, mm -hmm. um, that is going to be the thing that is going to lead him uh, back into the war, back into this uh, path to Kleos. Well, I know time is going on, and we have three other passages we want to get to. Can we talk about the um, Odyssey passage sure. now? Sure. Um, is there someone who would like to read the Odyssey passage for us? Can I just Say, so what you 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 remind me of a of a, a big contrast that I I feel about uh, Achilles and uh, and Odysseus is that uh, Achilles is like the a uh, symbol of the transitoriness of um, of life, whereas Odysseus is the um, a symbol of uh, survivability and, and surviving and uh, persistence. Um, mm -hmm. And and th that la that second half of line 191, hope a in a you know, it's like, you know, waiting until he finishes. It, I mean, it's it it reminds you that Achilles' song's about over. When this epic's over, uh, he's he's finished singing, and, and Homer doesn't show it, but that's part of the transitoriness, starting in the middle of things and not finishing the story. Mm. Just you know, hinting to it's it's going to end soon when Thetis says, you know, my son's not going to live much longer. Well, let me so let me die right away. I'm going to avenge Patroclus. Um, anyway, I think this this is like a little mi microcosm of that uh, transitoriness of uh, Achilles. Yeah, and we do get that. I mean, in line with what you're saying, we we do get that foreshadowing at the end with Hector's funeral, and so to have that anticipation of Achilles' own death, I think uh, it's a nice way to read that that uh, last half of 191 to think about when it is that someone is silenced, mm. you know, with with death. Right, right. Which is, yeah, I mean, there are lots of beautiful ways that if you look at um, the poetry of death, it's, it, it is about silencing and a binding, which I think is interesting, too, when we think about what you're saying about Achilles, which is, here's this moment of great restraint, right? There's something about that, too. It's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, you know what, guys? I'm, I'm, I'm not getting the most responsive um, control over what's presenting, so I'm going to try one more time to present... Um, to share what Sarah is doing for our audience, okay? Uh, so that hopefully we can screen share. It should be presenting. It just takes a while. Okay, so I think it's coming up. So um, if there's someone who can see it, there we go. Um, uh, Sarah, would you like to read it? Or is there someone else? Maybe Helen, would you like to read, honestly? 19, lines 107 through 114. I think she will. Okay. My lady, no mortal on the boundless earth could have quarrel with you, for certainly your glory reaches wide spread heaven, has, has thus that of a blameless king, a God fearing man who, as the Lord among many noble men, upholds good laws, and the black earth bears wheat and barley and the trees 
are loaded with fruit, and the sheep bear young continuously, and the sea provides fish because of his good leadership, and his people thrive under him. So, so here we have um, Odysseus praising Penelope, right? Yeah, so <laughs> in case, uh, an addition here is so fascinating. Um, this idea about the blameless king, right? So here's another important thing for you. The idea of the laws, right, which will be important when we turn and start thinking about the dharma, which I'm sure, can you pronounce it correctly for me? Yeah, dharma. Dharma, okay, I'm trying. Um, so, so, so where do we begin now with this next beautiful passage? Well, I think, you know, a lot of uh, scholars have thought about this relationship between Odysseus and Penelope. Why is it that she, he needs her, right, to, in order to, yes. to, to mm -hmm really get back into power in order to uh, make his family whole again, in order to make his kingdom whole again. Mm -hmm. And so I think that uh, whereas we see, in, I, I'm just thinking of this on the spot now, but um, the contrast between Achilles and Patroclus in the previous passage with Patroclus just sort of being silent and mm -hmm. uh, in line perhaps to pick up the performance. It's a little different here. Here Penelope is actually the focus of, of the, mm -hmm. the, the poetry in a sense, at least initially. And then he kind of brings it back to himself. At least that's what most people think, that right. he's, he's going to be the blameless king. Which is so interesting because, I mean, there's so much of the odyssey that is self-talk, right? Odysseus talking about himself, right? So this is right in line with everything. Um, yeah. And just this idea of restoration, I mean, you know, we, we use this word, you know, when we, we think of a, a king regaining his king, kingdom, but then to actually have it demonstrated for us, okay, this is going to happen with the fish and the earth and mm -hmm. the, the yes. you know, the, the trees and all this, and it's it really uh, makes it pretty vivid, I think. Right. So it's about this overall fertility, right, that the good king brings. Overall fertility and and the fact that uh, it's it's predicated on this leadership and and the justice the righteousness right but it's interesting right I mean what we what we're getting here is we're getting the laws we're getting plants right and fruit and we're getting animals mm -hmm. um, but you know so so but I mean it's not that people aren't mentioned but um, but it, it seems like the focus is really on the laws, right? And, and then about this moment of singing praise, there's something about that, that about where the people are in, the, in this moment of praise, right? Yeah, it may be. I wonder, you know, um, it's helpful, I think, sometimes to think about law as a social construct, to think about law as something that, that is the product of people as mm -hmm. opposed to um, just one person. And so um, the thing that allows him to be distinguished as a king is the fact that he's ruling over other people and so mm -hmm. the people come in at the end with their you know his people thrive under him in that with that yeah, people thrive last him, yeah. part of uh, line 114 um, but the 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 attention seems to kind of take it I mean the, the attention follows each of these different entities in, in a progression. So it seems in this sequence, if you go back to, um, let's see, this is 114, 13, 12, uh, line 111, when it goes to the uh, Gaia Malina, the, um, the dark earth, and um, how the earth bears wheat and barley, and the trees are loaded with fruit, and the sheep bear young. I mean, you, you get this kind of building toward the people, in a and sense. And the people find the yeah. long way. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yep, yep, yep. That's so, so it may it may be in a way that that you kind of need the natural stuff to be in place before you can you can have the social stuff. Before, in order to have law, you need first to have uh, this kind of growth. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's kind of fertility. Yeah. And um and so on the boundless earth. So that that's an interesting. And he's a God fearing uh, fearing man. So God. He he's um, he he's loved by gods because he respects them and mm. honors them. Mm. So so um, what are other people looking at in this passage? What are you noticing or wondering about? Anyone? Sarah or Christina? Perhaps. 
Or Jack? Is Jack moving forward to ask something? Well, uh, I, I, I hear these light motifs of uh, Kleos. Uh, as I recall, when, when Odysseus, well, we, there's so much uh, anticipation and anagnosis in the Odyssey. Uh, so here, you know, she wants to know who he is. And uh, so he deflects a little bit with this uh, encomium uh, of uh, her virtues, and uh, and th then says, "Don't don't ask." But talking about uh, her, her uh, Kleos goes up to the broad to the broad heavens, mm -hmm. uh, and that's exactly how he um, finally acknowledges who he is when he's talking I say exactly well let's say in in thought it's it's, it's the same thing as a moody cells of laerti adults kai um uh uh I'm this is the son of laertes whose fame goes up to the sky um so there again, you have uh, the language of the poet pointing to the um, uh, what shall we say uh, alterity and identity of the uh, the two people. Right. So somehow, I mean, the class is linking them in some way. Yes. Yes. And 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 some. Sorry. Go ahead. I think you just said yes. You were right. Okay. Um, so this. Uh, it, it is, I think, the case that he will not achieve Kleos unless she's there. Right. And so to, to have them linked just in the, in the performance context and in the fact it, that he's bringing up her glory before he brings up his implicitly. And so for you, I mean, one of the things you pointed out is that, uh, you know, it seems to you that his class is really, in, it really is in jeopardy, right? It is not Claire. I think it's not. I think I think at least uh, in contrast to to Achilles. I mean, he's someone whose parents are mortal, and he's someone who's who's um, who's having to fight to just sort of keep afloat. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of, <laughs> yes. of that scene. You know, where he's floating on that that <laughs> one <laughs> one timber beam from the raft. You know, right. you know, kind the of tossed around. Out, right? Yeah, and, like, they just let it all go, and be like, no, not until I absolutely have to. And you know, and uh, Janet's point about the um, the Theodes, the the God fearing. Um, I mean, he literally has a lot to fear from the gods, right? I mean, you know, if you think about his yes, interaction yes. with with uh, uh, yes. Okay, but what does he say at that exact moment? Remember, before he takes off, and he says, "Listen, even if a god is going to zap me in the middle of the Pontos, I'm going to head home anyway." Instead of staying here and being mortal. So I mean, he's like aware of it, but he's and he's afraid, but he's still going to go for it. That's one of my favorite. And most inspirational things, right? Because it's not that you're not afraid. That's not what being afraid is. It's being afraid and then doing it anyway somehow, mm. right? Yeah. Um, Poseidon's laughter. Yeah. Right, right, right. <sighs> um, okay, so okay, let's take a moment now. Um, we do have some viewers joining us uh, through Google Plus, and and if you are um, watching and would like to participate in the live Q and A, you can find the link on the Hour Twenty Five website on the blog post that's associated with this event. Um, and you can follow the link right there to the Google event page where you can participate in the live Q&A. If you have questions, we invite you to post them. Uh, we're ready to take them and to answer your questions. Uh, if not, we'll continue our conversation. Um, so uh, if anyone does want to participate in the Q&A, please feel free. Otherwise, um, maybe we'll turn to our next, our next passage. Sure. OK. So uh, our next passage, uh, let's see, can someone else read? Christina, can you read for us? Don't make eye contact. <laughs> 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 you think just because you're in Greece, that won't work, but it'll <laughs> uh, Oh, I'm sure if I make any mistakes. Oh, over the 10,000 10, years of his reign, Raghu's Sion sponsored hundreds of horse sacrifices featuring the best horses 
and abundances of gifts. With the aid of his half-brother, Lakshmana, powerful Rama, whose arms extended all the way to his knees and whose shoulders were strong, protected the earth. No widows wailed, and neither pred predators nor diseases posed a danger while Rama ruled his realm. There were no robbers in the world, adversity did not impringe on anyone, and old men never performed the funeral rites of youths. There was all manner of happiness, and everyone was focused on doing right. They, training their sights right on Rama, did not hurt one another. They each lived for a thousand years and had a thousand children, but had neither diseases nor distress, while Rama ruled his realm. The trees always were flowering and fruitful as they extended their branches. The rain god sent down showers at the right times, and the touch of the wind god was pleasant. The people, who were satisfied with the very occupations in which they respectively engaged, were focused on doing right and told the truth while Rama ruled. They all showed signs of success and were devoted to right doing. And for 10,000 years, Rama ruled. Wow, that's a great passion. <laughs> okay, so this is probably new to many of our community members. Um, so can you can you take us through this? If sure. Because we really haven't. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Um, so this is in the Ramayana, and this is actually a passage um, about the glorious kingdom of Rama. And so Rama is a hero who, like Achilles, is semi-divine. He's actually, uh, well, it's a little bit more complicated. He's actually half of the uh, deity Vishnu, the divine preserver, reborn on earth. So he is human, but he has this divine heritage that is always kind of creeping up in the Ramayana. He doesn't actually know that he's, um, it, he doesn't realize that he has this divine connection. Mm -hmm. He kind of has to be told about it periodically, and the epic <laughs> seems to forget about it um, <laughs> as he's doing all these amazing things. Um, but one of the things that happens is that uh, he loses his wife, has to get her back, they end up being separated by death, um, but this this uh, portrait of his kingdom actually occurs after that. So even though his own personal life has not ended happily, he is focused on, on ruling the kingdom as well as he can. And so he's seen essentially as kind of a, a, an epitome of, of dharma. He's someone who is able to embody righteousness and, and basically make it happen mm -hmm. on earth. Mm -hmm. And um, th this particular passage actually is, is interesting too because later on, um, even up through modern times, political leaders always point to the Rama Raja, the kingdom of Rama, as sort of this mm -hmm. ideal kingdom in South Asia. And so um, someone like Mahatma Gandhi who, who grew up worshipping Rama, that form of uh, Vishnu in that form, mm -hmm. um, for him this, this was a resonant passage too. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And so, I mean, we see a lot of um, we see a lot of similarities to the passage where we were just reading from the Odyssey. Like, yeah. Uh, and we see a lot of passages, a lot of similarity, I think, to things like the Hesiodic tradition of the Golden Generation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, because these are cognate traditions, right? Uh, in many ways. Um, so it's interesting that we're seeing these kind of same ideas uh, about what's going to happen uh, when your ruler is doing things correctly, right? Yes. Living appropriately and ruling appropriately according to the laws, is that it? Yeah, and I think um, one thing that's interesting to me too is the fact that in the previous passage where we had Odysseus sort of anticipating how he was going to come back and, and make things right again, mm -hmm. this, this is kind of taking us through a, a foregone uh, outcome. I mean, we know that, we, we actually know from the start of the Ramayana that, that Rama is who he is and, and that he's going to achieve what he's going to achieve. So uh -huh. it's sort of, there, there's some interesting resonances with the Iliad and the Odyssey, I think, right, because right. he's someone who's marked for success early, <laughs> but we also get to see him uh, demonstrate it in, in, in later life. Mm. Um, so does anyone have a thought or question so far on this passage? In this passage, um, it struck me that how people people's happiness is a sign of greatness of the ruler. Yes, I was wondering about that. That that idea, even of a sign, is interesting. Can you talk a minute about yeah. Um, so in the Indian tradition, and, and maybe it, it, in in other traditions too, there there's this idea that 
um, a ruler is judged by the kingdom that he keeps. So if you want to know how righteous a ruler is, you can just look at the physical condition of his kingdom. You can look at the this, the way the land is. You can look at the mm -hmm. at um, how well the crops are growing. You can look at how happy the people are. Even even their physical condition. You know, they they either are going to uh, live long lives and be f extremely fertile and mm -hmm. uh, prosperous. Or they're not. Um, they can also. It's it's also the case that they themselves will behave better if if the if the right ruler is in place. It just seems to be in the air almost. It's, 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 <laughs> you know this, this idea of, of uh, how they tell the truth when Rama ruled like toward the bottom of that passage. Mm -hmm. um, I think yes. it's uh, line eighty eight. So interesting. I mean, some of the details here are so interesting to look at the, the differences, right? To be satisfied with your occupations, right? Yeah, very very hierarchical system here because you have a four class society, mm -hmm. and so um, some scholars have, have wondered if if there are connections between India and Greece. But looking more uh, looking in later times, thinking about Plato and his. Uh, ranking of, of society mm -hmm, and that kind of mm -hmm, stuff, mm -hmm. um, but here, um, in part, I mean, this this is quite late, quite a bit later. The the Indian epics, the bulk of them were composed from about 200 BC E to 200 CE. So so we're centuries mm -hmm. later, and mm -hmm. so in some ways, I think that the poetry kind of reflects some of the social developments. Right, and he. For ten thousand years, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and a thousand children. I mean, so this is, I mean, this is part of the aesthetic of this tradition, right? That you've lived for a thousand years and had a thousand children. Um, it's really beautiful. Yeah. So, so you know, two are not enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I wonder if you could just say a few words, because I bet this is probably something that is significant, but not. Um, you know, something that our community members have thought a lot about, uh, this idea of horse sacrifices, right? So yes, um, that's very different, right? And I know people are thinking about horses. Yes, Kiwi's uh, working on it. Yes, she is very... Oh, wow, okay. Horses, yes. So... Um, the one on the other end. That's okay. So one of the things that um, happens uh, in ancient India is this idea of uh, the horse, I mean, it, it is a practice, a ritual mm -hmm. practice, the horse sacrifice. Um, horses are, as in other traditions, royal animals. I mean, they're, they're thought to be associated with, with rulers, particularly, and a ruler often has a very favorite horse, has chariots, has all this kind of stuff. And so for a horse sacrifice to occur, there's actually sort of a, a prescribed ritual where it, it's linked to a number of things, but one of the important roles, functions that it has is uh, power expansion. So the ruler sets a horse free, and the horse goes wherever the horse goes, <laughs> and there's an army that follows the horse yeah. around, and every ruler whom, whom the horse, uh, whose, whose kingdom the horse walks into, has a choice to make about whether he's going to stand and fight the, the army that's accompanying the horse, or whether he's just going to say, no, it's fine, you can rule over my kingdom. Uh -huh. So this is one of the major ways in ancient India that pa that um, empires were were expanded. Mm -hmm. And so there's this connotation when, if you can perform hundreds of horse sacrifices, that means you're basically spreading your kingdom all over the place. You're, you're, you're uh -huh. extending your, uh -huh. your kingdom um, throughout the, the geographic region. Because and then every time that this ritual is done, uh, at the end, it would be the horse would be sacrificed, right? Yeah, yeah. and so the, the the horse is allowed to roam free for a year, and so then um, after the the army and the horse finish their their travels for the year, the horse comes back and is sacrificed, and this is a really uh, capital intensive sacrifice. Lots mm -hmm. of uh, gold, lots of uh, resources go into mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm actually one of the things I'm interested in is this idea of stability within these poetic traditions mm. and about how that's created. And it's so interesting um, because I, I think a, a horse sacrifice is part of um, this moment of uh, not installing the king, I can't think of the right word, but um, sort of crowning the king and then just that rejuvenation of, of the kingship all the time, right? Um, and so, so it's about sort of keeping that fix, that power fix, and at the same time there's something about it's spreading, right? Spreading out and keeping it moving. Um, and so class is sort of like that too. It's 
is fixed, right? It's this idea that it's unchanging, it's unwilting, it's and yet it's spreading, it's moving to the top of the sky, <laughs> moving, right? So there's nothing so beautiful about that connection between the, the animals and um, moving and the, the class. Um, how about anyone out there? Anything come up? Oh, Helen has something. Great. Uh, I was just wondering, because uh, for 10,000 years, Rama ruled, uh, uh, does it, what does it imply about uh, uh, immortalization? Uh, that, you know, it's, it's not clear with this text if uh, Rama is immortal or if he lives for quite a long time or uh, what about immortalization in the uh, in this passage the yeah. idea of it's 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 interesting it's actually meant i mean in the in the context of the epic itself it's it's thought to be fairly literal so he's actually someone who at the end of his life does go up to heaven and he actually leads his people up to heaven um, and so this uh, time period is thought to actually elapse from, from the perspective of, of uh, the authors of this. And so, um, but, but because it's such a, a long uh, time period, um, th this I think g goes back to um, Ellen's point, but the, the idea that um, you have this such a long time period, it makes you wonder, okay, well, who is this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so you start thinking, okay, well, he's half of Vishnu reborn on Earth. So if he's if he has this divine connection, then there's something different about him. I mean, even just comparatively within the passage, you know, the people are living for a thousand years, but this guy is ruling for ten thousand years. So so he's he's around longer. He's going to his lifetime is going to span more. And I love that idea as we're thinking about just ensuring the, the generations, right? Uh, which is so important as you're thinking about this transmission of knowledge, right? And then you think about that passage we had in the Odyssey where it was just, you know, the, um, basically the sheep of the good king, they just, they keep giving birth in series, <laughs> in season, like, <laughs> unending, you know? Um, and so, but so it's that, but people are bigger and, yeah. That's so amazing. Um, so I, we only have about ten minutes left. So uh, so let's go to our next passage. Okay. Which is a thing from. Uh, hold on, I can't get mine to move. And then I'm going to go back to you, Sarah, so that people can see. Great. So this is the Mahabharata. Um, so it's it's book three, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and it is. How would we say chapter sixty four? Uh, yes, it it is uh, chap chap chapter yeah chapter okay. sixty four uh, lines nine through nineteen or verses nine verses nine through verses nine through nineteen. So I'm going to try to screen share for our community. Um, and, but if someone wanted to read, uh, as I try and get this over there, that would be great. What else are you? <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, maybe Sarah, would you mind reading again? While the Nishapan, the king, was living there, his thoughts kept returning to the lady from Vidarbha, and every evening he always recited this one verse. Where in the world is that wretched, weary woman going to bed, hungry and thirsty, with that dolt on her mind, and whom is she serving now? One night, as the king was saying this, Jivala, Bahuka's other assistant, said, Who is that woman whom you are always lamenting? I want to hear about her, Bahuka. King Nala replied, Tarfwit had a woman whom he thought highly, and she had an even higher opinion of him. Something separated that dunce from her. And in his deprivation, that dullard is wandering around, gripped by grief, being burned by sorrow day and night without respite. At night, he remembers her and sings his single verse. That man wanders the world over, found something somewhere, and is living there unworthily, remembering his anguish over her more and more. That woman went after that man, even into the frightful forest. 
but having been abandoned by that man of little merit, she hardly can be alive. Alone, young, not knowing her way around, unaccustomed to and undeserving of all of this, and seized by hunger and thirst, she can hardly be alive. That man of little merit, that half-wit, abandoned her in the huge, horrid forest where predators always are on the prowl, my friend. This is how the king of Nishada remembered Namayanti as he hid in that other king's home. Okay. <laughs> so, so this is, now, now this is very different, but now we're getting another recollection about someone, but this is uh, a little less praise. A little more, a little more blame. Yeah. So, so, so self-criticism, really. Mm -hmm. So, so Nala here is in disguise, and so he's disguised as um, this charioteer bard named Bahuka. In the Indian tradition, uh, there are these figures, charioteer bards, who are actually the ones who are composing the epic poetry. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, he's disguised as one of these figures. He's remembering how back when he had been king, he had abandoned his wife in the forest after he they. Fall, they'd fallen on hard times, um, and his wife wakes up, finds her husband gone, and has to essentially sort of fend for herself. Now he had been actually possessed by a demon when that happened, so we can kind of he's sort of <laughs> so he's covered. covered. Okay. Yeah, um, <laughs> but um, the the idea here is that he he um, the demon whom he was possessed by actually embodies the most. Uh, the, the age, the time period during which dharma is at its uh, lowest point. Okay. And so the idea is that he needs to somehow, um, and it's actually named for a throw of the dice, like it, it's named the Kali Yuga, the, the, mm -hmm. age of the, um, the age of the losing throw. And this, this dice throw is essentially tantamount to snake eyes. So you have, um, he needs to learn how to dice in order to get his kingdom back. Mm -hmm. And so you have this idea of randomness and trying to chance and trying to get your, your world back in order. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, in Indian uh, cosmic time works so that you're moving from fixed eras to, to fixed era to fixed era. And as that happens, Dharma is getting progressively weaker and weaker. Mm -hmm. And so when this, when this is going on, um, Yudhishthira, the king who's hearing this, has his kingdom is is basically plunging into that final era of of tough uh, times because righteousness is at its weakest point. And then it, it's going to come back. It it will, but not in his lifetime. Wow. Yeah. So this is sort of as you know one of the um, one of the words that we studied is tell us. Yes. Uh, right. And so you think of it as a turning point, and we've talked about it as coming full circle and completion, or Sort of starting over again. So this is this is not a good this is not a good talos to reach. No, no, and and this is the con one of the big contrasts between the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. The Ramayana has this triumphalism. You know, we have the kingdom of Rama, yeah. and and the Mahabharata is more. You know, even when Yudhishthira does win the kingdom, um, it turns out actually that the world has actually been rid of most of its population. There's just been this horrible struggle that has torn apart his family and. Mm -hmm. um, you know the the earth is just not in a good not in good shape, right? And so so then I mean, how 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 is this teaching us then? Uh, what is this teaching us then about rulers and about uh, you know for the audience who's listening? I think one of the interesting things that happens here, and and you can decide whether or not it works for the Greek poems, but I, it's certainly the case in the Indian poems um, that there's a parallel drawn between the queen and the land. Yeah. And so there's this idea that the king is the protector of both. He's supposed to keep, make sure his wife is safe. He's supposed to make sure his kingdom is safe. And so throughout uh, both epics, there's this idea that a ruler is, is someone who makes sure that, that his, his wife is safe. He, mm -hmm. And he also makes sure that um, the land is, is, is fertile, that it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's doing what it should be doing. And so someone like uh, Nella in this story is isn't doing neither. He's he's uh, actually been uh, thrown. His his brother has overthrown him. He's no longer king in this uh, in this particular passage, and he also separated from his wife. He he had abandoned her. So um, this is kind of a meditation, I think, on on what happens when when ruling is not being done well. Mm -hmm. So so he's wandering, and she's wandering too. Right? Yeah. 
So, which is the, the opposite of what we have in the Odyssey, which is, I think, so beautifully balanced. On the one hand, you have Penelope just fixed to that bed, which is still rooted in the ground, while Odysseus is wandering around. And so there's something, I think, that the poetry is acknowledging about that combination. Like, like, like when you're weaving, right? You have your warp and you have the weft, and that's perfect. Yeah. But if you don't have them both, then you're it's 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 more unstable. And and here actually she does go back to her her uh, parents, and she she goes back to her her native kingdom and, and is able to to sort of wait for him as he comes back. He makes his way back to her. And we have a story that that something something is related to the Odyssey of someone coming back and being in disguise and yeah. eventually mm -hmm. yeah. And another sort of a remarriage. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So and so that's the question always in the Odyssey that Odysseus repeats over and over again: Is she still beside my son? Um, right? And is she keeping everything steadfast? Right? Is she keeping everything there? Um, right. And then the, at the end with the the marriage. I mean, yeah. sense, you know, with the the music being played yes. and everything. Right. Right. Wow. Okay. Um. So Janet, do you have a question? Because I have more questions actually. But I bet other people have questions too. I hope other people jump in. Yeah, Jack. Oh. Uh, Suba, I I, uh, I read this uh, story years ago, and uh, you know it's, uh, it's certainly uh, beautiful Sanskrit. Uh, but uh, as I thought about it after reading it, uh, I I came to think of Damayanti as you know this wonderful, fantastic woman that everyone would dream of having as a wife, even the gods <laughs> want her as a wife, and Nala as a uh, you know, he was born handsome and talented, but uh, he he was uh, really a horrible example of uh, of a man. <laughs> right. Okay. Not yes. Yeah, so we have some blame here, right? I mean, in in the Disney yeah, stuff. But he accepts the blame here in this in this this uh, song here. In the the poet, you know, puts the blame on the gods. You know, for so um, is, is there a Connection between Greek and uh, Indian polytheism, where you have good gods and bad gods, and 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 people get tricked by the gods. Well, it, it's interesting because um, the demon who possesses Nala is actually um, a, a a class of noble demon, um, as opposed to their their baser demons who who are nastier. But um, the noble demon actually, uh, the word for that is asura, which means non-god or anti-god, and there's actually thought that um, in ancient Iran, when when there was a distinction between the traditions of ancient Iran and ancient India made, mm -hmm. um, basically the pantheons were flipped. And so the the gods that later became um, demons in the Indian tradition were originally yeah, yeah. gods in the in the in the Iranian tradition. Oh, and and so so this figure um, wow. who possesses Nala is is an Asura. And so oh, wow. okay. Pandemonium. Uh, that's the the concept of pandemonium, where a demon becomes, uh, you know, the, uh, Dios becomes demon and and mm -hmm. vice versa. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. I was wondering about Dios itself. You know, Dios in Greek and and in Sanskrit, it, it has yeah, so so many different uh, meanings, including dice. So um, the the term deva is cognate with with deus um, in Latin and then um, deus in, in or theos in, in Greek mm -hmm. and so um, you and then this idea of related to the gods deva fate is, is it, it can be it can mean either it can either mean um, related to the gods deva or it can mean fate and so this this idea of, of one's destiny being both random and yet Somehow dictated by the gods. That's fascinating. Thank you, Janet. Did you were yeah. Kind of um, we talk about Pan Hellenic tradition. Is there such a thing, Pan Indian tradition? In a sense, yeah, there is, because these these epics were composed in a time period between two big empires, and so during this time period, there was thought to be a lot of political fragmentation, mm -hmm. and so one of the perhaps 
motivations behind the creation of these epics was to try to unify people from different parts mm -hmm. of India. And, and you have um, stories originating from different parts of India, and mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. where the, the manuscripts come from. And, and so I think it, there, there is an analog to the, to the um, Pan-Hellenic mm -hmm. tradition in a sense here. That's really interesting. Because it's such a big, big country and all different languages. Yeah. 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 And, and regional variations, you know, in the retellings of the stories and things like that, too. Wow. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I just realized that it's 502. So, unfortunately, um, so we need to sign off. Uh, sign off. So, I mean, obviously, we're just scratching the surface here, right? People could study these for thousands of years, obviously. <laughs> um, so I hope you will actually come back and talk to us again. Sure. To continue these conversations. We really, really appreciate it. Um, Thank you, everyone. And I realize we didn't have people introduce themselves, but um, so uh, but we really do appreciate your uh, participation. And Greg now is coming to comment. Greg, we're just finishing up. It was a beautiful discussion. Bye. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you in two weeks' time when we're going to talk to Nicholas Pragalakis. Uh, don't miss it. It'll be on that two weeks and Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank Take you care. all. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Right, I Bye. just need to shut off now. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.